Welcome to the University of Michigan School of Information webinar on the Master of Applied Data Science degree. My name is Amy Humpkiss Hayes. I'm a MADS team member, Assistant Director of Academic Program Development in the School of Information and proud Michigan alumna. We're so happy to have you join us today as we answer your questions about the MADS degree. I have two esteemed faculty colleagues who have joined me for about an hour that we'll spend together talking about MADS. I'm gonna go ahead and let them introduce themselves. Jiaoju. Hello, nice to see you here. My name is Chiaoju Mei. I'm the faculty director of the MADS program. Uh, and when I take the director hat off, uh, I'm a professor at the School of Information, University of Michigan. And I run a research group that works on uh, large-scale data mining, machine learning, information retrieval, and other areas related to applied data science. So it's my great pleasure to um, uh, serve in the program and to educate the next generation of data scientists. And Chris. Hi, I'm Chris Brooks. I'm a assistant professor here at the School of Information uh, at the University of Michigan. Uh, I teach in the MADS program, in fact, one of the first courses on uh, uh, applied uh, data mining um, uh, and data manipulation. I teach in the online MOOC degree or MOOC program as well and in our residential program. And my research interest is actually in learning analytics, so applying data science to education, learning, and teaching. Great, thank you so much. So as we get started, let me address a couple of housekeeping things. First, as you can probably see, all of us are joining you, uh, uh, you separately from our uh, residences. And Chris, in fact, is in another country. So a country, I should say, outside of the United States where Zhao Zhu and I are. So Zhao Zhu and I are close to Ann Arbor, Michigan, close to the University of Michigan where we work and live. Um, we anticipate that everything will go swimmingly and we won't have any issues at all. But in an instance where someone drops out, for example, it's likely a connectivity issue and hopefully they'll come back. As I indicated, Chris is actually currently overseas, uh, but also able to join us and we're hoping will be with us for the full hour. I should also add that because we're all in our homes, you may see disruptions here or there. That's very common um, because we're working all virtually today, but do know that we're here with you for the full hour, ready and happy to answer all of your questions. So as we get started, I'm going to go ahead and let Chris and Zhao Zhu talk a little bit about the kinds of courses that they teach in the MADS degree. Chris, can you tell us a little bit about the courses, particularly SIADS 505, which would be one of the first courses that students would take if they joined us in the MADS program? Yeah, great. So this course is called Data Manipulation, and it's one of the first technical courses that you would take in the program. Uh, we uh, teach it residentially or, or versions of this uh, residentially as well. And uh, this is really a programming course. So you jump in day one and we're doing Python programming. And uh, the goal is to really uh, make you comfortable with data, uh, make you comfortable with patterns in data and being able to take data and, and transform it and give it some structure. So uh, we use, as I mentioned, Python. Now that's actually common throughout the degree program. Python are really the, the foundation that we built this uh, program on. And in this data manipulation class, we uh, go through the pandas uh, toolkit in particular, uh, regular expressions. We talk about time series data a little bit and autocorrelations and so forth. Now, one of the interesting aspects that you may be aware of with the MADS program is that our courses are four weeks long, roughly one month long. So this course is uh, I would say pretty intense in that it starts right away and you have full access to the content of the course and can start churning through those. But at the same time, it's scaffolded and supported. So every week we have, uh, um, you know, not only do you have the lectures in the online platform, but it's not an online textbook, right? You have access to us, the faculty, to our graduate students or our other GSIs, we call them grad student instructors. We have kind of various touch points throughout the week and we try in different to handle different time zones so that people can actually work uh, on that uh, content and get the kind of nurturing that you might need and expect, frankly, from a degree program. Great, thank you so much, Chris. Um, Zhao Zhu, so you also teach some really cool courses in the MADS degree. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience, for example, teaching data mining one and two? Sure, absolutely. 
So once you have taken Chris data manipulation, you, you are able to register to uh, data mining one. Um, so this is a course that teaches uh, students how to uh, uh, deal with real world uh, data sets, uh, how to represent them into uh, you know uh, formal uh, data structures like um, uh, item sets data, like matrix data, uh, vector data, like sequence data, and then uh, in, later in data uh, mining two, we'll talk about. Uh, uh, time series data, we talk about data streams, uh, and then uh, data representation is the one very uh, critical step uh, between you get your data, you put them into databases, you put them into the right format, uh, and then to uh, use the data for analytics tasks like machine learning. So what we do is to get the data into the right formulation and then extract patterns from data, extract uh, knowledge from the data, and then understand uh, which uh, data objects are similar to each other. So in data mining one, uh, we will talk a lot about algorithms to extract such patterns, to assess the distance similarity between different data objects. And then data mining two, we will go deeper into understanding how to model the data, how to describe you know, the, the statistical properties in the data. And all of them are actually uh, feeding into downstream machine learning tasks. You can use the patterns as features. You can use the distances as building blocks uh, for future tasks. I have to say that uh, you know I have taught data mining one for two times. Uh, haven't uh, been teaching data mining two yet because this uh, this course is still under uh, construction, <laughs> right? Uh, data mining one is the fun course. Actually, uh, during the course, uh, you can see that students are actually learning uh, the importance of how to represent uh, the data in the real world, uh, how to describe the data uh, in mathematical ways, right? And then meanwhile, you are also learning a lot from the students because they always bring in uh, you know, different perspectives from the practice, right? They understand their data better than you do. So it, it, it's another fun teaching those courses. I'm so pleased to hear that, Xiaoju. So you've been teaching in the MADS program for about a year. We've been running the program for about a year. You're also, of course, the program director. Can you give us one highlight of this past year? What's one thing about the MADS program and your involvement in it that's really struck you? Well, I have to say that I have been proud of this program a lot. So um, you can see that, uh, you know, um, before we put this program together, uh, the faculty, and the staff spent lots of time uh, innovating the curriculum, right? Thinking about you know what would make us the best uh, data science program in the world, right? And we had lots of uh, uh, efforts uh, in designing uh, you know the, the what we call end-to-end -end data science curriculum that obviously does not uh, exist anywhere else. And then uh, we try a lot of measures to balance rigor and flexibility, right? Uh, we uh, want to build a data science program that's not just moving our residential program online, that's actually made for my students, right? Uh, that works better uh, pedagogically and also scientifically, right? To understand uh, the life cycle of uh, doing data science in real world, right? And then we wanted to provide lots of flexibility for students because most of them are actually doing them, you know, uh, when they have full-time jobs, right? So. It's not a challenge, I can tell you, <laughs> to design such a program. And from the past year, I think, you know, this mostly, you know, paid off, right? Uh, we see that students are enjoying their old paces uh, in the program, right? Some of them are taking one classes uh, at a time. Some of them are taking two classes simultaneously, right? Some students are, uh, you know, uh, moving towards uh, data analytics. Uh, faster, and some students uh, prefer to, you know, learn about uh, the uh, introductions like data science ethics uh, more, and before they go into the technical courses. So they are apparently enjoying this flexibility that we provide to them, right? And that's really exciting. Thank you so much, Oju. Like you, I'm incredibly proud of what we've been able to do over the past year, and I'm very excited about what is to come in this next year. Chris, what's been one highlight for you? Yeah, so the students by far. Um, I'm amazed at, at the students that have matric matriculated into this program. They're, they're brilliant, dedicated, passionate, and uh, incredibly diverse uh, from incredible different walks of life and domains. And uh, it's been just a great joy, actually, to enter 
so it sounds like I'm kind of kissing up to the students, but uh, it's been a great joy to work with the students. And I'll hold out a couple of examples of things. Uh, for instance, we've started a book club that we're reading a book this summer uh, uh, about algorithms to, to live by. Um, we have a sports analytics club that was started, and this was really started because students were interested in this. They got some of us interested in it, and we kind of hived that off and jumped off the, on that. Uh, some of the projects that I've seen some of the students uh, do. So one has started a project, uh, uh, the student's a lawyer uh, and has uh, started a project looking at uh, equity and justice and access to legal aid by underserved populations and an analytics approach to that. And a lot of this didn't come directly out of the coursework but aligns well with the coursework. And so uh, for me, that's really been a powerful, uh, a powerful piece of this uh, is that the classes are large enough, diverse enough, and, and are gelling uh, that uh, there's communities. And that's something I'm looking forward to as, as we continue to grow capacity uh, and, and grow the number of students, continuing to diversify and see new communities grow and uh, engage and really how we can use data science and apply data science as we're learning uh, and teaching it uh, to change the world. I really appreciate that sentiment, Chris. And like you, I've seen tremendous opportunities for our students to participate in real world problem solving. So another great example being the MAD students who were invited to participate in creating a COVID-19 dashboard for the state of Michigan as we track public health, um, which is a very real, as we all know, and very serious set of needs that state and federal governments uh, currently have around the world. So thank you for saying that. Like you, I'm highly enthused by our students and enjoy engaging them every day in the MADS program. So um, this probably goes without saying, but if you have a question, please, I welcome you to ask it in the chat. Um, I am the responsible kind of facilitator moderator here who's going to be reviewing questions and then giving them to Chris and Zhao Zhu. Um, a couple of things that I will add, if you have a really specific question, something that would be unique to you, for example, I welcome you to email umsi.mads, M-A-D-S at umich.edu. We are happy to answer that question um, over our email. We have several folks, including me, that monitor that email account. I would also say in an instance where we don't get to your question, we're also welcome to answer it again over email at umsi.mads at umich.edu. So let's go ahead now and turn it over to some of the questions that we've been getting. I see lots of really good ones. So Chris, you have the advantage of teaching both in the MADS program and in our residential um, programs in the School of Information, as well as being one of our faculty who have created a MOOC. So as Chris indicated early on, he is one of the primary faculty in our applied data science uh, with Python MOOC hosted on Coursera. Can you tell us a little bit, Chris, about the value add of the degree or how you differentiate the degree as opposed to the certificates that we offer through our MOOCs, for example? Absolutely, yeah. Thank so uh, first and foremost, the degree is up to date. Every year we revise, we uh, reconsider and uh, make sure that the uh, content is up to date. Those who will have taken my MOOC, especially lately, will know that there's a, a little uh, a crust on it. It's gotten, you know, a couple of years in the world of tech uh, uh, is a long time. And uh, while we're going uh, and updating it right now, uh, that can be frustrating. And so uh, that's one of the benefits you get with that um, degree uh, uh, experience. Certainly we have um, more content in the degree. The assignments, uh, I would say, have a different level of rigor and that's um, that changes course by course. For instance, in the second course I teach uh, in the first semester, the exploratory data analysis, uh, a lot of the assignments are hand graded, whereas the closest equivalent we would have in the MOOC has a lot of peer grading because we just that scales in that way. Um, in, in our degree uh, offering, we treat our assignments and our evaluation like we would our residential. I think the other big thing is you have a, a much smaller cohort. We have technologies to support. Uh, so we have, for instance, we use Slack heavily throughout the degree. Uh, every course has a Slack channel, then all of these different clubs and such can have Slack channels. And so um, that building of community uh, really is there in the degree and I would say is very difficult to get 
worked in the MOOCs. Um, and then you also get face-to-face uh, -face time uh, uh, with us as faculty. Now, face-to-face -face time is largely through Zoom, uh, and that's actually true for our residential students right now as well. So we're all working through what that means. Um, but it, it, it doesn't have to just be through Zoom. So I've met many of my students face-to-face -face in, in real life, IRL, uh, who were able to come to Michigan for various things. Uh, some of them have come for, we have convocation once a year. I'm not sure what's happening this year, but convocation once a year where people can come. And I think we had a, a dozen or 15 med students at that event, which was awesome. Um, I've worked with a number who are close in Michigan, but I've also worked with and seen some face-to-face uh, uh, -face who have come from across the U.S. and frankly across the globe. I've had students drop in and say, hey, I'm here uh, visiting a campus from Costa Rica and I wanted to drop in and say hi. And I'm like, geez, you should have told me, right? Like I would have taken you out to lunch or something. Uh, and so th this is, uh, it, you know, you get that that time with faculty uh, if, if that's something that you want. Um, and so that's a huge difference from, I think, the MOOCs where um, largely we don't get to know the students in the MOOCs and the attention from the faculty on the MOOCs is, is, is pretty minimal once we've launched them. Great, thank you, Chris. I appreciated the thoroughness of that answer because it does come up. And one of the things that early on we had to be really clear with is that this is a degree that you get academic credit with a degree, with a diploma at the end, um, as opposed to our MOOCs where you're getting certificates, which can be really valuable for professional development. But this is a full master's degree program with all of the components that you would expect to get in any degree. So Zhao Zhu, as you can imagine, we're getting folks that are asking questions about how the degree relates to their interests. So for example, can you talk a little bit about how somebody that is interested in entrepreneurship might um, in, embed that interest in the degree um, in their trajectory as a MAD student? That's a very good question. So uh, the, the program designed for people who have the mind to apply the data science techniques uh, to the real world domain, right? Uh, and entrepreneurship is definitely one of those domains, right? Of course, we have other domains like, uh, you know, uh, learning analytics, like social media analytics and others. Um, if you think about how to apply data science into the domain of interest, you will you really see that uh, there's the big pipeline of things. There's the, uh, we call it an uh, end-to-end -end pipeline uh, of things. First, you have to um, um, understand the, the, the background. You have to be able to formulate uh, the real world task into a data science problem, right? And we teach that. Uh, and then uh, next step is that you need to, uh, you know, collect the data. Right, you put them into uh, the best computational infrastructures, you store them, you put them into different formats, and uh, you use uh, techniques uh, to explore the data, to discover insights, right, to discover hypotheses, and we teach that. Um, so if you think about uh, data involving in uh, the entrepreneurship, you can see that there are uh, data about uh, your products, you can see that the data about your supply chain, the data about your customers, user behavior data, right? Uh, lots of them, right? Uh, when you collect them, uh, how can you actually link them together? How can you extract uh, you know, knowledge, how can you understand that, uh, oh, I'm talking about, uh, you know, user behavior data, but in fact, I'm actually talking about sequence data, right? Because uh, a data comes in with, uh, uh, you know, different, uh, you know, events, and events have orders, right? You're also talking about time search, and that's what you learn from data, data mining, right? In fact, we use lots of real-world examples like this uh, in those, throughout those courses. And then once you can actually extract the data, extract knowledge, right? Next step is to analyze them, to really discover, uh, you know, actionable insights, right? You do classification, right? You, know, you build supervised machine learning pipelines. You build unsupervised machine learning pipelines. You cluster the data, right? Uh, in order to understand, right? Hey, uh, so I can divide my customers in this way, right? Uh, and then uh, you put them into the machine learning pipeline. Right, and that supports uh, the, uh, uh, the the data science uh, supply chain in, in your business, right? And then, if your business has lots of text data, you need natural language processing. If your business has lots of social network data, then you need network analysis. And most importantly, that you you will always need to find causal uh, you know uh, causal insights. That's where you need causal inference, right? 
And what's important is that after so many uh, you know, uh, analytics tools, you need to convey the information, the knowledge that you discover from data to the stakeholders, to your customers, to your manager, right? And we have uh, a good coverage um, of communicating data science results, of information visualization, of presenting uncertainty. And those serve uh, in the purpose of communicating what we have discovered from data to humans. Right, but that's not the end, right? Once you have discovered so many important things, so many uh, new knowledge uh, from your data, what you really want to do is to use them to make profits or to use them to change the behavior of your customers, right? Uh, of course, towards the good way, right? So uh, in industry, this is known as running A-B tests. This is known as building experiments, right? So we have courses covering experimental design and analysis, uh, teaching you how to design those experiments, those A-B tests in a rigorous way, right? And how to measure the effect uh, of uh, data science driven interventions, right? And at the end, uh, we will provide opportunity to you to use your domain, to use the data in your domain, to use the real problems of your domain, to conduct three portfolio building projects, two milestone projects and one capstone projects where you can really use what you have learned in the program to apply them into your domain, in your problem, right? And then show that it works for your business, for the problems that you care about, right? So uh, you can see that this is what we are trying to provide to students who have a particular interest in a particular domain, not just entrepreneurship, but also uh, in other uh, very good domains like healthcare, like, uh, sports, as Chris said, like learning. Thank you, Zhaozhu. What I really appreciated about that answer is that you highlighted so many of our really fantastic MADS courses, um, some of which are already in production and some of which are to come that we're very excited about, but also how you made sense of how our regular kind of one month credit, one month courses engage our um, larger project-based courses are two milestone and capstone courses where folks are really taking their skills and applying them in domain areas that are exciting and kind of interesting to them, but they're also building a portfolio that they can then share with technical or non-technical recruiters so they have evidence of the kinds of work that they're doing in MADS. Now, relatedly, as we all know, a lot of our MADS students are already full-time working professionals and are in data science-like roles. Chris, can you talk a little bit about how you've seen students take some of what they're learning in MADS and apply it immediately and kind of directly into their professions? Yeah, um, so, uh, you know, just anecdotally, there's been a lot of interesting uh, uh, cases. So I've actually, you know, even coming out of SIADS 505 and into the exploratory de uh, design, uh, had a, a mid-career um, member who uh, uh, had a job offer change. Uh, and part of it was that it, because he was in this program, was learning uh, new things. And, uh, you know, there was a clear opportunity and they saw growth in that and could continue continue uh, working on, on for instance, more advanced machine learning. Um, so it was very much, they were like, yes, I, you know, your domain background is excellent and you've already developed these skills. We're interested in, in having you and having you involved here. Um, I've seen a lot of people um, who have uh, taken the, the, the tools and techniques that we teach in the program and change their workflows in their day-to-day -day, uh, business world as well. So trying to, for instance, there was a, a, a student who is in uh, finance who is starting to use the uh, tools and techniques to do some fintech uh, work uh, to try and understand uh, markets differently. Um, I've also seen people use uh, the knowledge that they're gaining as uh, mid-level managers or, or higher, um, where they're working with a team of data scientists. And really one of the reasons they're engaging in this kind of learning is to understand enough of the technical skills that they can direct others to, uh, to be uh, doing those. And I've seen some uh, who have talked a little bit about uh, their entrepreneurial goals. And I haven't, I can't point you yet to the company that's spun out, that they've spun out, but because so many of our students are, uh, you know, have a domain experience of another kind or in a career already, uh, they're actively thinking about how to use uh, um, 
these with these skills, the data science skills, and apply them with their domains. And for me, that's been the exciting thing. I, I get to learn a lot more about these different domains and the problems they have. And like Zhao Zhu said, um, when you think about stocks being bought and sold, you can actually think of these as sequences and sets of data. And you know that's what I do in my research with education is think about student interactions as sequences and sets of interactions. And so a lot of what you learn in this uh, program is transferable to these applications and is really the, the goal of the program to support that, uh, that translation. That's great, Chris. I mean, you really highlighted um, some wonderful anecdotes of how our students are directly and meaningfully applying the MADS curriculum in their professional lives. Um, in all of the MADS students that we work with, we see kind of the direct translation of success in the MADS degree space as it relates to their professional objectives, some of which traverse academe. So for example, Chris, I know that you're working with some MADS students um, in other capacities. We had someone who asked the question, you know, can MADS students be GSIs or can they be GSRAs like other University of Michigan students? Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, I, uh, in fact, I just talked to our associate dean uh, because I'm looking for GSIs, graduate student instructors for my SIADS 505 class. And uh, um, last year we had a cold start problem, a classic uh, computer science problem in that we had no people who had taken the yeah. class and so to find people to support it was a little bit harder. Um, and uh, this year I, I got the green light that I can recruit from people who have taken that class. And that's exciting. That's uh, and, and is a, a, a great way to be able to build those peer relationships. So as many of the students know, this is a um, 33, 34 credit unit program. And uh, ideally you could take it over one year, but most, um, all maybe of our students are taking it in a longer time frame, And so that gives you an opportunity to build across cohorts, a community as well, a peer interest community. And I think that that's really powerful with the different kinds of projects that, uh, that I'm like the sports analytics that I'm seeing uh, um, climb. And so this is another way to support that by having a grad student uh, instruction um, and have those students come from uh, the MADS program. Uh, one of the biggest challenges actually we'll have, I think, with that is that our many of our students in our MADS program are employed. Um, and so, you know, that, that even though we have, we have a, a wonderful group to recruit from, uh, many of them have day jobs already and may not be able to uh, spend the time. Uh, but I've been, I, I will say that something that I was very uh, really strongly impressed on me on the three MADS classes that I taught uh, last year was the work with inside the cohort uh, to gel and to help one another. And uh, one of the novel aspects of the curriculum, and this is not for all classes, but I think for most uh, uh, of, of the courses, is that when it opens, you can go through it at your own pace. Now that changes a little bit if you don't have some auto graded programming assignments and so forth. But I think it's true for 70% of our courses. And the benefit of that actually is that we have some students that just crunch right away at it and others that are taking it at this more measured week by week pacing that we suggest. And it, and it creates a, an in, inbuilt peer help uh, community. And I've really seen the students respond very positively to that. And that's been a, a wonderful thing as well. So to answer your question, there's lots of ways to get involved. And uh, GSIing uh, is one of those. GSRAing is one of those as well. I hired a student out of the MADS, uh, uh, out of the SIADS 505 uh, class to help me work on a MOOC on sports analytics uh, because of uh, his passion in that area. And so um, definitely there are ways to get involved. I also know that the there's ways to get involved with research. They're not always uh, paid, or sometimes they're paid as a, a subject in an experiment, but I've had uh, one of my doctoral students, for instance, recruited from MADS population. I think we had 15 uh, or so students respond and go through our experiment and work with us on that. And uh, that's been wonderful uh, as well. So there's lots of ways to get involved. Thank you, Chris. I really appreciate the positivity of your sentiments about our current students because we do love them. And um, we've seen them really avail themselves to lots of opportunities 
as we've created them or as we've observed other opportunities that we've availed them to. Um, so I think you're exactly right that we only foresee a future where there may be more opportunities for our students to get engaged in a number of ways. That of course would also include research. And as you can imagine, Zhaoji, we have students that are interested in doing research um, from conception through publication. Can you talk a little bit about how MAD students might avail themselves to research opportunities? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there are quite a few uh, opportunities. Uh, so of course, as Chris said, um, just don't hesitate to email the professors, right? So as the math students, you have uh, you, you know, the access to the entire body of world-class researchers uh, at your main site and at the University of Michigan in general, right? Just write to them, right? And then express your interest uh, in either their projects or bring your uh, research ideas to them, right? And we love to hear from you and we'd love to involve you uh, in our research projects, either ongoing or new projects, right? Uh, so that will be number one. Uh, number two is that uh, you also have access to the tremendously diverse cohort. Right, and you can actually find uh, you know people with very different skill sets, with very uh, you know related interests, right, and who wanted to who have the same mission to change the world, right. Uh, talk to them, right, and form small groups, form special interest groups like the sports and analytics group, like the health informatics group, right, uh, like many other uh, groups. Uh, and then, you know, you can invite faculty members like uh, Chris and myself into your discussion. And we'd love to provide feedback. We'd love to be part of it, right? And don't forget that you have three portfolio building projects, right? You can easily select, um, you know, um, a project with research value. You can select a project that could help you commit, uh, you know, your mission. Right, uh, and one thing to mention is that uh, the capstone projects, uh, we uh, wanted to uh, shape the capstone project so that it is applying data science techniques you have learned through the program into the particular application domain, right? So you can see that there are lots of opportunities there that uh, we have uh, you know, application-driven courses that you can take to understand the ongoing research, to understand the literature, to understand the background in that domain and to identify, uh, you know, the gap that you can really make your own contribution, right? And we have learning analytics, we have uh, social media analytics, and we have the new coming one, that is data science for such a good. You can see how many opportunities there are, right? So if you have uh, the, um, you know, the passion to do research, there are lots of resources available to you as the math student. Thank you so much, Arju. Um, I, I wholeheartedly agree and have seen, for example, MAD students who've communicated with faculty and have participated in research, formal or informal, um, in a number of ways. And uh, like all things MADS, I, I anticipate that we're going to see more of that in the coming months and years. So Zhaoju, we are getting um, folks who are really interested in specific topics within data science and deep learning is coming up. So can you just briefly tell us a little bit about how we're teaching deep learning in the MADS curriculum? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as you can see that deep learning uh, is uh, within the cluster of uh, analytics courses. And in that cluster, it starts with data mining and then it gets into supervised learning, unsupervised learning and machine learning pipelines, right? Deep learning is the course that really connects, uh, you know, data science to the state of art, to the cutting edge, right? Uh, blooding edge techniques, right? Uh, so uh, in those four weeks, we will talk about uh, you know, classical uh, deep neural network uh, infrastructures like um, uh, convolutional neural networks, like uh, you know, uh, RNNs, recurrent neural networks, uh, especially LSTMs. And then we will talk about attention-based models. Uh, we will talk about uh, some graph-based neural network models. So these are actually uh, characterizing the uh, most powerful models, the most powerful machine learning models nowadays. Uh, and that will really give students the exposure to what's being used by Google, by Amazon, right, by uh, DeepMind. Uh, and then uh, you can understand their applications in what you uh, recently heard, right? For instance, AlphaGo, right? For instance, uh, you know, uh, ImageNet, uh, DeepFakes, right? Or, uh, you know, uh, self-driving cars. So that would be the very exciting course. And that's going to be taught by uh, one of our uh, youngest and uh, most talented faculty member, Parmir. 
that I think was a great summation. Um, as, as Chris and Zhao Zhu know very well, I have a non-technical background, but because I sit in all of these discussions, I generally am very enthused by all of the technical content and deep learning in particular, I think is gonna be um, just a really cool course. So Chris, we um, have folks that are really interested, but also perhaps a little bit more curious about these one month, one credit courses. So we talk a lot about the benefits of our model, right? In so much as the flexibility that it enables students to have. Um, but you can imagine that there may also be some concern about the course intensity and around the rigor in a one month course. Can you talk a little bit about how we manage kind of breadth and depth across our curriculum given the model that we're using? Yeah, yeah. So these one month courses, the uh, very much uh, never was the goal to crush more into the course faster, uh, but instead to um, partition things up to stack a little bit more like Lego bricks and to be able to uh, allow people to build around their uh, careers that they might have their families or their other obligations. And um, so a lot of uh, this, this works often, uh, I think, quite well uh, for students. I haven't heard many say um, that after they've gotten into the program that um, they've had troubles uh, uh, with this. But sometimes they wonder about two courses versus one course. And the program has been designed from the onset so that at the beginning, you can choose between uh, uh, sort of uh, everything or I wanna get into the Python technical stuff right away or not. And you can kind of calibrate yourself a little bit uh, there. I think this is another place where I've seen cohorts really help as well. Um, you know, one of the, because I teach the very first course in the, in, or the first technical course in the program, um, one of the challenges I see with people coming in is, are my Python skills good enough? This is undoubtedly the biggest uh, question that comes in. UMSI as a school is very flexible. We, we have a very flexible uh, drop policy, for instance, for students. Uh, we have a very flexible retake policy. I feel our student services group, which Amy is in, uh, uh, works very well with the students to, to make sure that we can fit their uh, careers and uh, uh, life outside of this. For instance, I know one student who was, you know, working pretty solidly on the first semester and got a new job and started the new job in January and had to step back from the program. And there are options for that. And then he's coming back, you know, this summer to work on some of those other courses. And that's the other cool thing about uh, the, this, the way the program has been designed. The goal, I'm not sure we're there yet, we're getting there, uh, but the goal is to offer the courses regularly, every semester to offer most or many of the foundational courses. And so you don't if you are unable to take a course for whatever reason, you uh, can be relatively assured that there's another opportunity to take that course uh, relatively quickly. And I think that that's a, a beautiful part of this program that we've tried to pull in from uh, our experiences with the MOOCs. When I, I went through undergraduate, sometimes you just couldn't take a course. It wasn't being taught that year. The professor was on sabbatical and well, your degree doesn't have that course in it, uh, uh, whether you wanted it or not. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, with this program, we're going for um, a different level of uh, um, options for students being very aware of uh, the diversity of background and life. I really appreciate that, Chris. I mean, we, we've thought really long and hard about how to create a curriculum that's flexible, but still essential in preparing leaders in data science. And so where in a residential course, I know Zhao Zhu, you and I talk often about how in a residential course, you might have many concepts covered in a 15 week course. In MADS, you might be taking three or four courses that cover that same you know, breadth of content, but you're getting it in the one month, um, one credit, courses. And so in an instance where you do have a professional or personal obligation that requires you to step back, you can confidently step back in um, in a, a way that we would argue might be much easier than a traditional program. So uh, one, please, sorry, yeah, please, Chris. No, I, I, I welcome you. you know, my background is as a computer scientist. I went through a computer science program, work programs. And uh, one thing that I love about UMSI, about a school of information and about our faculty and our approach to teaching 
important is uh, how we care. <laughs> and so we care about mental health. When people have a surgery, it's not, well, you failed the class, or when people have to take a step back uh, for, for various reasons, we care about people as people and recognize that. Um, that's not always true with all programs. I think that some programs are more about weeding out people or, um, really categorizing people and so we've got a whole bunch of this stuff designed into our curriculum to support life events but one thing that i want to really hold out about our school about the ethos of our school is that we care about our students as people as well and so students have a lot of facilities on campus that they can uh, access uh, for that and, and some of those are available uh, virtually as well but uh, the people should know that coming into this there is that almost family-like feel uh, when you're a student at UMSI and I don't think that that's uh, typical in higher education. Uh, I don't think that's typical in all, all programs. And so that's not a structural thing that we've built in the curriculum, but it's a structural thing that we built in our school, our department, and I think is a strength. Thank you, Chris. I think that was actually a great ad. And it really speaks to the combination of kind of formal and informal supports that we offer MAD students. Some of those are curricular supports and how we communicate and in the ways in which our courses manifest themselves with asynchronous and synchronous learning opportunities. And some of those are informal supports and in how we work with folks that are experiencing life and what it might mean if, if life um, interacts with your degree progress in a way that, that forces you to make a change, you know, that we were happy to kind of come alongside with you and help you make that change. So Zhaozhu, can you tell us a little bit, we've been talking a little bit about some of the things that make our program unique. Can you just add your perspective on what's the primary difference kind of between our, or differences between our program and other data science programs for those that are looking across a number of programs? Absolutely. So, um, well, uh, first of all, uh, we're not a computer science program, as Chris said, that uh, we have, um, we wanted to attract students who really wanted to use these techniques to change the world, right? And we're designing the program, we're designing the curriculum to help you achieve that. So this uh, program uh, features in uh, applied data science that, uh, you know, connects uh, two ends, connects the end of, you know, you get the data, you formulate the problem uh, of data science problem uh, from your real scenario all the way uh, to the end of you use what you discover from this process to you know to change the behavior right of a uh, human right to uh, uh, provide interventions right to make the world better so uh, we we cover uh, the whole uh, spectrum um, of things uh, through this program and that's what we're really proud of um, as an uh, this program designed by the world-class faculty um, from uh, the uh, uh, School of Information. For instance, we have, um, uh, you know, Dr. Chuck, Chuck Sil uh, Silvers, who's the flag uh, in the world of uh, uh, MOOC uh, online education. And we have Professor Kevin uh, Clemens Thompson, who had, um, before coming to UMSI as a professor, he spent, um, you know, 15 years at, um, um, you know, in industry, right, at Microsoft Research. Uh, he's one of the leaders of uh, information retrieval in the world. And we have family members like Yan Chen, right? Uh, Dr. Chen is a, a very famous uh, behavioral economist, right? Uh, you don't actually have this resource from other programs that really helps us to build this, uh, you know, end-to-end -end pipeline that we have uh, experts to cover every particular uh, aspect, right? Um, so um, this program is, is unique. It focuses on, right, um, how to apply things to the world, world, how to connect uh, people, how to connect uh, data, and how to connect technology, right? This is basically the slogan of uh, School of Information, and we're proud to deliver this uh, uh, vision through the math program, right? So as we said that, uh, the faculty members sit down together, uh, we reviewed uh, what we had in the residential programs. And you can see that, you know, the residential programs has been uh, implemented for many years, right? Uh, it's like, right, uh, you, you, when, when you own your home for many years, you have lots of stuff <laughs> into your house, right? Um, you spend time uh, organize them, clean them, and put them into places and add new stuff. And really, uh, you know, think about uh, what we need in a program that's going to last for many years, right? What we need in a program that can actually transform uh, a passionate student into uh, the leader uh, of uh, data science in their field, 
in you know the, the application domain they, they care about. So to me that uh, this is uh, one of the biggest uh, you know difference between our program and other programs. Uh, some of them are more computer science -ish, some of them are more uh, you know uh, statistics -ish, right So our program uh, focus more on connecting people with information right. And of course, uh, the modularized design also differentiates uh, our program with many other programs, right? And that really provides uh, rigor and flexibility for students, especially for students who uh, have uh, full-time, part-time jobs, right? And you can actually graduate in one year, two years, three years, depending on, you know, uh, what your uh, schedule is, right? Uh, so uh, I think these facts uh, really differentiates our program with other programs. Thank you, Zhaoju. I, I appreciated all of that sentiment and it, and it certainly has rung true in my experience of observing all of what we're doing uh, with the MADS curriculum. And so as Zhaoju and Chris have both indicated, we don't require a computer science or a math background, for example, but we also don't shy away from um, understanding what it takes to use really strong computer science and math skills to do really good data science. So Chris, you and I have talked before about math and how it engages the MADS curriculum and some of what the math requirements are um, and then some of the math that we teach. Can you talk a little bit more about how students can get prepared for and then what we do in the maths curriculum to kind of help them with the math? Yeah, so um, a lot of what we teach in the program, we aim to teach at an intuitive, practical, and applied level. So those are the words that I would use uh, to describe that. Um, those sometimes require some fundamentals in math. So I'll, I'll take statistics as an example, which I think is particularly powerful and important uh, for people uh, to learn. Um, it's important to come in with some knowledge of statistics and we reaffirm that knowledge in a few of the different programs. Uh, so we have a math methods uh, program that's right up front. Uh, it's a one month course to help boot you and uh, give you that grounding so that you understand some basics uh, of statistics statistics of uh, uh, linear algebra uh, and of calculus at that intuitive level. But there's an expectation that coming into the program that you have that base understanding of statistics and uh, probability as well. A lot of this gets built on throughout the program and sometimes in interesting ways. So uh, I, I'll point to the class presenting uncertainty, which I think is really unique and powerful mm -hmm. for our program, um, because this underlies a lot of what, what we do as data scientists is try and uh, understand how to make a decision in the face of uncertainty. And so there are some classes throughout the program that take on aspects of mathematics, but you won't find a calculus one class or a calculus two class here. A lot of students coming into the program, the, the, the biggest uh, concerns I see from students on their skills are, do I have the Python chops, the Python knowledge? Am I able to program enough for this program? And do I have the basic math skills? I took linear algebra in the 90s or in the, in the early 2000s. So those are the two biggest concerns I see from students. I think that the best way to prepare for those, frankly, is, is from some of the MOOCs that are out there. Um, this is a, a low cost way to prepare to get hands-on uh, um, uh, experience. Uh, on the Python side, uh, Michigan, uh, in fact, UMSI teaches two of these, and I'm in one of them. Dr. Chuck uh, teaches one that's, that's I'm not sure I know anything about Python. I want to start learning. And then Paul Resnick, Steve Oni, myself, and others uh, from the school, oh, and, and Chuck's in there uh, too, uh, teach another one called Python uh, 3. Um, and I think these are great resources for students to, to uh, jump into. Um, and I would really encourage you, if, as you're prepping for September, if you're, if you're planning to come in for September, or if you're prepping for, let's say, January, and you want some things to do over the next coming months, I would encourage you to take uh, one or both of these classes for the Python skills. On the mathematics side of the world, we've got kind of three different areas, statistics, linear algebra, and calculus. 
at the statistics level, there is a option that uh, um, UMSI doesn't provide, but the University of Michigan does that I think is great. And uh, I think we can send out a link to that. I'm not sure what it is, but if you search for statistics on Coursera, you will undoubtedly uh, find that uh, course. There are though linear algebra fundamentals programs as well. And I think that that would be my second uh, go-to uh, if I were a student coming into this program. With calculus, I think that um, the important part of calculus for this program is understanding, and, and Jiaoju can jump in here, is understanding calculus at an intuitive level. So there's methods like gradient descent, which are calculus-based, and um, you will not be doing proofs in this program, uh, but it's important to understand what calculus does try and solve for us, and how we can apply packages uh, that, that uh, use calculus uh, to do that. Yeah, uh, definitely. I want to echo uh, what Chris has said, right? So if you look at the curriculum of our um, uh, program, right, um, it does not teach like uh, operation systems, right? It does not teach uh, like, you know, high dimensional regression. And so those hardcore uh, computer science and stats, uh, you know, courses. But uh, almost every class uh, that we offer has the blending of you know, stats of, um, you know, math and computer science, right? For instance, uh, if you look at data mining that I'm the most familiar with, right? Uh, you know, you need to understand uh, stats, especially, you know, correlations, especially vector spaces, right? That is one very important topic in linear algebra, right? And you also need to understand Python program. You also need to understand the algorithms, right? Why we need to actually uh, use a priori algorithm to actually, you know, improve the efficiency of counting uh, the number of patterns, right? So um, there are lots of other examples like deep learning, Right, uh, and uh, it's hard to get away from uh, you know deep learning if we don't teach you you know a good blending of computer science, hard core computer science, and stats uh, understandings, and uh, you know um, things like gradient descent, right? Uh, and we also have courses like causal inference that you probably couldn't find in you know the computer science program or uh, you know our um, uh, you know another uh, data science program. Right. So one way to look at this is that we don't actually teach um, math or computer science or stats out of the context. And in fact, we blend them in into you know, many of these courses. You can say that our program actually has 20 stats courses, has 20 <laughs> you know, programming courses, and so on and so forth. Right. But uh, as Chris says that, don't shy away from uh, you know, the challenge uh, of these courses because uh, you know, we help you you know, gradually, steadily, uh, from day one, we help you to actually practice your programming skills, to practice your understanding about stats, about linear algebra, right? And then if you need any help, don't uh, hesitate to reach out that we have lots of resources that we can provide you, right? We have uh, books, right? Uh, you can easily spend uh, like a few months to go over, uh, you know, other European books like uh, um, Python 3 programming, or like, uh, you know, statistics in Python, right? And we can also provide uh, tutors, we can provide, uh, you know, a lot of uh, human resource for you to help you get the basics to succeed uh, in this program. Excellent, thank you um, both for your really thorough comments about how we use math and um, Python in our program and what we ask that you come in with and then what we build over time as you're a MAD student. So I'm gonna answer just a couple of quick little logistical questions about admissions. I will also say that we have a dedicated admissions webinar coming up. So in an instance where you want more specific admissions information, I will be facilitating a webinar with one of our admissions staff in the School of Information who can answer any and all uh, admissions questions. So that being said, let me just answer a couple that have come up really quickly. So um, how do we actually assess you? We use Coursera for the assessment in addition to using Coursera for the degree itself. So in an instance where you're invited to take the assessments, which you would be uh, when you apply to the degree program, you will get links to the um, either a combination Python and stats assessment or a stats only assessment in the instance where you produce the Python 3 certificate that indicates that you've successfully completed that MOOC series. In either instance, you'll go into a Coursera course shell where you'll have access to resources, 
practice assessments, and then the actual statistic in Python assessment or statistics only assessment. So that's the system that we're using. We have a pretty step-by-step -step process and a lot of hands-on involvement along the way. So um, do know that there's a lot of engagement with our team to ensure that you're traversing those assessments um, appropriately and kind of correctly. We're always also available to answer questions in that regard. We do require if you um, are a non-native English speaker, the TOEFL, generally we're looking for around a, a score of 100. Um, however, you know, again, there, there can be occasional exceptions to that. We also recognize that right now is incredible. It can be often difficult to find a, a TOEFL testing center. So you are always welcome to email us at umsi.mads at umich.edu with your TOEFL concerns, and we can work with you on creating an alternative. In an interest, in instance where you are interested in seeking financial aid in the form of a UMSI scholarship, I will tell you that our scholarship process is actually quite simple. When you apply to the MADS program, and if you apply by the priority deadline, you are automatically considered for scholarships. So there's no separate scholarship application that you have to complete. There's no laborious process by which you have to apply for scholarships through the school. And in an instance where you're interested in other types of financial aid, we can certainly help direct you to what those may be, including our Office of Financial Aid at the University of Michigan that has lots of information about other financial aid sources. I will also tell you it's very common for us to work with employers who are sponsoring part or all of MAD students' tuition, and so we're happy to work with you if you're interested in getting a sponsorship agreement or you need to produce documentation to your employer, um, both at the outset of your MAD's participation and as a MAD student. And then I would uh, finally say that in an instance where you're currently completing a bachelor's degree, our expectation is that that bachelor's degree would be complete when you start the master's degree. So for example, if you're graduating with your bachelor's degree in December and you can verify through a transcript that you finished and graduated in December, then you could start the MADS program, for example, in January. So as I indicated before, we have more opportunities coming up for to answer admissions questions, um, but I did wanna take just a couple of minutes to address a few of those that have come in. We do use a holistic application process. So we're looking at all of the things that you submit, your um, undergraduate transcripts, the answers that you give to our essays, the results of your assessment attempts and passing those assessments, previous work experience. I mean, we're really looking at everything when we make application um, or admission decisions, and we're happy to talk in more depth about that. So as we go ahead and wrap up, um, Chris, can you tell us just at, as we close, why should someone apply to MADS? You know, what, what makes us different and exciting? And what would you tell somebody who was thinking about but hadn't yet decided to apply? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I guess I would go back to the students have been amazing. And so actually the cohorts have been great. And uh, the students uh, are, are really kind of gelling together. We built a program. We built it uh, brand new and specific in this interesting modality uh, of one month courses for uh, people who were mid, early, late career, so who, who had other things in life. And uh, that seems to have worked stunningly well. And, uh, you know, that plus a UM's prominence in the area of data science, the faculty that we have at UMSI, and the support that we give our students, I think, makes the program uh, uh, well worth uh, the application. And of course, if data science is a hot area, I probably don't need to sell people on this call that data science, I think, is, is a starting to become a fundamental skill. But if they were looking at this versus another thing, uh, I do think that uh, data science is permeating disciplines, domains, and businesses, and uh, everybody uh, could use more, more understanding of data science and methods. Thank you, Chris. Choji, what would you say? Well, um, well, Chris said that really well, right? Uh, so uh, I wanted to say that uh, you know, your MSI has the mission, has the unique mission to uh, connect people with information, with technology. And we wanted to use information technologies and data science techniques to you know, change the world, to make the world better, right? And wanted to actually deliver this mission uh, with our students. We wanted to engage with students who have the same mission, to have uh, you know, the same passion to make the world better using data science. Um, 
But if you look at our residual programs, we cannot you know, deliver our uh, education to thousands of students, right? Uh, and you know, for people who cannot come to Ann Arbor, right? For people who cannot leave their jobs, leave their family to come to Ann Arbor, we couldn't do that. Right. And this is the whole purpose of creating maths, right? To really deliver our mission, our value, and our, uh, you know, uh, world-class uh, education program to all the people in the world, to the students in the world, to the next generation of uh, applied data scientists. No matter whether you can come to Ann Arbor, right? No matter whether you are at a stage of uh, stopping uh, your job for two years and coming to the program, right? Uh, we just want to work with you to create a better world with data science techniques, right? And this is what we call the Michigan Valley. Right? Both of your comments were incredibly well put um, and such a fabulous end to the hour that we've spent together. So as I indicated before, we have a couple of more upcoming webinars, one with admissions and one with current MAD students who are gonna to talk to prospective MAD students, which we're very excited about. Um, as I indicated, if you have additional questions, you may also always email us at umsi.mads at umich.edu. Otherwise, I extend my deep gratitude for joining us for this past hour as we talk about all things MADS and we look forward to reviewing your applications. Thanks so much and as always, go blue. The blue. <laughs>